Okay, we'll open it up for questions because I'm sure there's going to be some questions. <coughs> Senator Hansel. If I may, uh, first of all, Mr. Niedermeyer, thank you very much for coming over here. And I've got a couple of questions, if I may. Uh, <clears throat> it seems to me that uh, uh, most likely in a PAC situation that uh, the young ones learn from the adults kind of a learned behavior, uh, how to hunt and how to take food source. Would that be correct? Mm -hmm. And do we do you run into a situation where if there's a particular food source, say domestic, that you could end up with a, what might be called a problem pack or that they choose to do that rather than, I mean, uh, it would seem to me that uh, that's a possibility. Does that ever happen? Yes. Um, Wolves generally recognize deer and elk as their principal prey, but um, there's a learned behavior sometimes where uh, wolves cross the line. They uh, <coughs> get familiar with livestock. I think generally wolves are intimidated by livestock initially, but uh, when they do cross the line and either uh, eat dead beef or decide to tackle a, a vulnerable calf, um, they can develop this behavior. Uh, that's the time we always talk about, you know, preventative measures, non-lethal measures. You need to apply them early on before that stage happens. But uh, generally, when you have a wolf pack that develops this behavior, it's very, very difficult to break them of that. Follow up. Mm -hmm. uh, w could you tell us a little bit? It's kind of my attention that Idaho had, maybe it was under your time, the White Hawk wolf pack. Was that one of those packs that developed that, and what happened there? Yes, the White Hawk uh, Pack, um, we spent uh, nearly five years using various preventative measures, non-lethal measures, uh, radio collaring. Um, I won't go into all the different tools, but we tried just about every uh, tool in the box from flattery to rag boxes. Uh, eventually, that pack uh, chalked up about 30, 34 head of livestock, and uh, it ended up that we lethally removed that entire pack. And I'm assuming this is, was not in Oregon, this was in Idaho? This, this was uh, on the East Fork of the Salmon River in Idaho. One more follow-up? Yeah. Um, Russ, you said that uh, in Oregon we have six packs. Uh, do we have any, uh, at this point, what you, maybe the department would say, a problem pack that this learned behavior that was over on the Idaho border is developing in Oregon at this point? Uh, potentially or uh, of the six packs do we have any that may be, be moving towards or have arrived at that same kind of learned behavior? Senator Hansel, uh, uh, we, we do. The Amnaha pack clearly starting in, in May of 2010 uh, was the first depredation that we documented of that pack and since then um, I'm, I'm not sure I could tell you exactly how many depredations, con con confirmed depredations. Uh, I think it's about 26 losses and then a number of injuries. So I do know it's over 30. Um, despite the use of, of, uh, of pretty significant non-lethal measures, not just by our agency, but also by the, the producers of the area. So uh, whether it's the same, I'm not, sh I'm not familiar enough with the, the case of the White Hawk Pack, but but clearly, uh, uh, it is a long-standing uh, depredation problem. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Senator Hess, and then we'll go over see if there's one here. Thank you. I guess this is to the Department of Agriculture. The uh, the fund that you mentioned that is dwindling. Uh, we passed uh, the tax credit, which was mentioned here earlier, and both of them go after the same policy, which is to uh, make whole the ranchers who lost livestock. And uh, the question has come up, why do we do both? Why would it, if the fund is, is a more efficient way to do this, um, couldn't we, um, I mean, I'm just asking your opinion on whether it would make more sense to say double the fund and eliminate the tax credit, or is there some, some balance there that I'm missing of having both? Chair Dinkfelder, Senator Haas, I, I'm not an expert on the tax fund and maybe why that was. I can just speak for our fund. It's, it's broader in the sense that it does cover those proactive measures as well as the, the losses. And so I think it, it really is up to the producers, I think, to look at the programs and choose the one that best meets th their needs. Um, so. 
And uh, and that is slated. Just to follow up to that, is the is the depredation fund slated to in the governor's budget to be funded again at the same amount, hundred thousand? Chair Dinkfelder, yes, it is. It's it's uh, right at a hundred, like it was before. I, I will also add. I think when our fund was set up, it was set up with the idea that there could be, would be donations. That hasn't happened yet. Um, I think our hope is now that the fund is up and running and the county's block programs are up and running, uh, maybe more confidence will be in the program and we may see some uh, dollars move into that fund. And maybe when we have the uh, cowman up here, we can ask him how that fund's working for them and any feedback they might have. So. Other questions? Did you have a question, Senator Bates? No, just real yeah. quick, if I could. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mr. Niemeyer, since you're here, and you're from Idaho, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Now, this concerns uh, Elk and. Make his trip worth the money. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think it's going to, but thanks for coming anyway. Yeah. And, uh, um, there are several families in Southern Oregon that uh, used to go to Northern Idaho for elk hunts in the fall. And in the last couple of years, they stopped going because the local guides up there told them that the, the depredation of elk herds and. Uh, and the mule deer was so heavy, it wasn't worth going. And the last couple of years, they've stopped going because there just weren't any elk left. Uh, I know that's that's a very anecdotal story, but what's been the effect of the, on the elk and deer herds in Idaho with with the increase of wolves? Well, Senator Bates, my answer is probably going to be different than most people in Idaho. Um, I can counter with anecdotal stories uh, from out-of-state hunters who tell me they enjoy the fact that many of the Idaho hunters are telling everyone not to come and hunt because <laughs> I, <clears throat> I just met a hunter at a an outdoor rally this weekend who said he's been coming over from Washington and uh, very successfully killing very nice bull elk in an area over in the salmon region where the outfitters have been telling people don't come back because the elk hunting has been destroyed. Uh, but the northern panhandle, I don't know a lot about it other than I know it, you get into fire suppression. Uh, there's a lot of other issues that had been going on for a long time before the wolves came along. Senator, Thank you. Any other questions? Senator Olson, did you have a question? Yes, I yeah. do. Uh, Mr. Neor, first for you, thank you for coming over. It's a long trip, and, and we uh, appreciate your expertise. Uh, Mr. Morgan, um, have the wolves gotten close to human living quarters and, and ar in and around livestock buildings that you know of? Senator Olson, the short answer is yes, um, on a number of occasions. Um, certainly as these wolves, uh, with, with the collars that we put on that I referenced, the GPS collars, we're able to tell the areas that they use. And there's many times uh, wolves, just like other predators, are, are pretty close to to, to human habitation. We've had some cases in, in Wallowa County where the, the, you know, the pack or the wolves, individual wolves, would be sighted uh, very near near houses. So, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have, uh, are these cases documented so that you know which pack it is and which wolves they are? Well, uh, Senator Olson, uh, we maintain data sets of, of wolf locations, so from that standpoint, yes. Um, a lot of the reported sightings near houses are fairly anecdotal. We do have a, a wolf reporting system. I believe we received 280 something wolf reports just in the year 2012. Not all of those are, of course, right near, near uh, uh, humans, but um, with a state that's, that's as developed as it is, uh, there, there's certainly an ample opportunity for wolves to be close to people. Hello? Hello? We haven't had any lethal interaction between humans and wolves at this point yet, have we? Uh, Senator Olson, no. Uh, follow up? Mm -hmm. how, how many do I get? <laughs> Until I cut you off. Okay, good. <laughs> no, I'm just um, <laughs> no, that, the, do, the you have, you have some. Uh, some uh, Permits that you allow the livestock owners to have, lethal permits. Uh, do they help the they do they help the ranchers? Are they are they a good uh, tool? Senator Olson, uh, the, I believe you're referring to the Cod and the Act permits. Um, to date, uh, the permits have not been uh, no no wolves have been taking on a Cod and the Act permit. Does so from that standpoint, uh, and and well over 50 have been issued. There's 21 out now, 30 some last year, uh, and no wolves were taken. <coughs> Follow up. Follow up. Uh, what, what's the difficulty if if uh, uh, Cattleman has his, his herd out there? and these wolves are coming around, they, I assume they don't come in, in in a small group, they come in in their pack. And what's the difficulty of the rancher to actually be able to 
inhibit this approach uh, with this permit? Uh, Senator Olson, a good question. The, the first difficulty is, is that we should always remember that wolves are secretive large carnivores. They're, they're, not, uh, they're primarily nocturnal. So most of these depredations or most of these encounters around livestock uh, are going to occur at night. And in fact, we believe uh, that's exactly what happens. Uh, and, and of course, they're just secretive. So like many other predators, we just don't see them all the time. So. The fact that it would be rare to see a wolf uh, and many of the producers, and I'll give an example, in Wallowa County, as much uh, is, as has happened over the last two years, there's many livestock producers that have not even seen the wolves. Um, some of those folks are in this room. So, yeah. One, one mm -hmm. last, and, it's, and it's for Mr. Henderson. Um, on the, uh, the awards and things like that, does this make the farmer whole, or is it... Uh, is he given any additional money for the the other mental state of his other cattle or is it just for the cow he loses chair Dean Felner and senator olson the the counties are charged with setting up their criteria for the, the value that they determine on those animals and and we have left it up to them to do that they have to have an advisory committee it has a certain membership requirement and so um we are we're getting from the counties now th their allocations and their methodology for doing that and it has a pretty s rigorous process for for doing that and so uh, i couldn't speak to any one county and how their methodology is but we'll have that in the report when we get that thank you thank you